Section 17 of Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Rato. Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. Sand. Chapter 10 The entire range of Henriot's experience, read, imagined, dreamed, then fainted into unreality before the sheer wonder of what he saw. In the brief interval it takes to snap the fingers, the climax was thus so hurriedly upon him, and through it all he was clearly aware of the pair of little humid figures, man and woman standing erect and commanding at the centre, knew, too, that she directed and controlled, while he, in some secondary fashion, supported her, and ever watched. But both were dim, dropped somewhere into a lesser scale. It was the knowledge of their presence, however, that alone enabled him to keep his powers in hand at all. But for these two human beings there, with impossible reach, he must have closed his eyes and swooned. For a tempest that seemed to toss loose stars about the sky swept round about him, pouring up the pillared avenue in front of the procession. A blast of giant energy, of liberty, came through, forwards and backwards, circling spirally about him like a whirlwind, came this revival of life that sought to dip itself once more in matter and in form. It came to the accurate outline of its form they had traced for it. He held his mind steady enough to realize that it was akin to what men call a descent of some spiritual movement that wakens a body of believers into faith, a race, an entire nation, only that he experienced it in this brief concentrated form before it has scattered down into ten thousand hearts. Here he knew its source and essence behind the veil. Crudely, unmanageable as yet, he felt it rushing loose behind appearances. There was this amazing impact of a twisting, swinging force that stormed down as though it would bend and coil the very ribs of the old stubborn hills. It sought to warm them with the stress of its own irresistible life-stream, to beat them into shape and make pliable their obstinate resistance. Through all things the impulse poured and spread like fire at white heat. Yet nothing visible came as yet, no alteration in the actual landscape, no sign of change in things familiar to his eyes, while impetus thus fought against inertia. He perceived nothing formal. Calm and untouched himself, he lay outside the circle of evocation, watching, waiting, scarcely daring to breathe, yet well aware that any minute the scene would transfer itself from memory that was subjective to matter that was objective. And then, in a flash, the bridge was built and the transfer was accomplished. How or where he did not see, he could not tell. It was there before he knew it, there before his normal earthly sight. He saw it as he saw the hands he was holding stupidly up to shield his face. For this terrific release of force, long held back, long stored up, latent for centuries, came pouring down the empty wadi bed prepared for its reception. Through stones and sand and boulders it came in an impetuous hurricane of power. The liberation of its life appalled him. All that was free, untied, responded instantly like chaff. Loose objects fled towards it. There was a yielding in the hills and precipices, and even in the mass of desert which provided their foundation. The hinges of the sand went creaking in the night. It shaped for itself a bodily outline. Yet, most strangely, nothing definitely moved. How could he express the violent contradiction? For the immobility was apparent only, a sham, a counterfeit, while behind it the essential being of these things did rush and shift and alter. He saw the two things side by side, 
the outer immobility the senses commonly agree upon, and this amazing flying out of their inner invisible substance towards the vortex of attracting life that sucked them in. For stubborn matter turned docile before the stress of this returning life, taught somewhere to be plastic. It was being moulded into an approach to bodily outline. A mobile elasticity invaded rigid substance. The two officiating human beings, safe at the stationary centre, and himself, just outside the circle of operation, alone remained untouched and unaffected. But a few feet in any direction, for any one of them, meant instantaneous death. They would be absorbed into the vortex, mere corpuscles pressed into the service of the sphere of action of a mighty body. How these perceptions reached him with such conviction, Henriot could never say. He knew it because he felt it. Something fell about him from the sky that already paled towards the dawn. The stars themselves, it seemed, contributed some part of the terrific flowing impulse that conquered matter and shaped itself as physical expression. Then, before he was able to fashion any preconceived idea of what visible form this potent life might assume, he was aware of further change. It came at the briefest possible interval after the beginning, the certainty that to and fro about him, as yet however indeterminate, past magnitudes that were stupendous as the desert. There was beauty in them too, though a terrible beauty hardly of this earth at all. A fragment of old Egypt had returned, a little portion of that vast body of belief that once was Egypt, evoked by the worship of one human heart, passionately sincere, the Ka of Egypt stepped back to visit the material at once informed, the sand. Yet only a portion came. Henriot clearly realized that. It stretched forth an arm finding no mass of worshippers through whom it might express itself completely it pressed inanimate matter thus into its service here was the beginning the woman had spoken of little opening clue entire reconstruction lay perhaps beyond and henriot next realized that these magnitudes in which this group energy sought to clothe itself as visible form were curiously familiar it was not a new thing that he would see booming softly as they dropped downwards through the sky with a motion the size of them rendered delusive they trooped up the avenue towards the central point that summoned them he realized the giant flock of them descent of fearful beauty outlining a type of life denied to the world for ages countless as the sand that blew against his skin Careering over the waste of desert moved the army of dark splendors that dwarfed any organic structure called a body men have ever known. He recognized them cold in him of death, though the outlines reared higher than the pyramids and towered up to hide whole groups of stars. Yes, he recognized them in their partial revelation, though he never saw the monstrous host complete. But one of them, he realized, posing its eternal riddle to the sands, had of old been glimpsed sufficiently to seize its form in stone, yet poorly seized, as a doll may stand for the dignity of a human being, or a child's toy represent an engine that draws trains. And he knelt there on this narrow ledge, the world of men forgotten. The power that caught him was too great a thing for wonder or for fear. He even felt no awe. Sensation of any kind that can be named or realized left him utterly. He forgot himself. He merely watched. The glory numbed him. Block and pencil as the reason of his presence there at all no longer existed. Yet one small link remained that held him to some kind of consciousness of earthly things. He never lost sight of this. That being just outside the circle of evocation he was safe, and that the man and woman being stationary in its untouched centre were also safe, but that a movement of six inches in any direction meant for any one of them instant death. What was it then that suddenly strengthened this solitary link, 
so that the chain tautened and he felt the pull of it. Henriot could not say. He came back with the rush of a descending drop to the realization, dimly, vaguely as from a distance, that he was with these two, now at this moment, in the Wadi Hof, and that the cold of dawn was in the air about them. The chill breath of the desert made him shiver. But at first, so deeply had his soul been dipped in this fragment of ancient worship, he could remember nothing more. Somewhere lay a little spot of streets and houses. Its name escaped him. He had once been there. There were many people, but insignificant people. Who were they? And what had he to do with them? All recent memories had been drowned in the tide that flooded him from an immeasurable past. And who were they, these two beings, standing on the white floor of sand below him? For a long time he could not recover their names, yet he remembered them, and, thus robbed of association that names bring, he saw them for an instant naked, and knew that one of them was evil, one of them was vile. Blackness touched the picture there. The man, his name still out of reach, was sinister, impure, and dark at the heart, and for this reason the evocation had been partial only. The admixture of an evil motive was the flaw that marred complete success. The names then flashed upon him. Lady Statham. Richard Vance. Vance, with a horrid drop from splendor into something mean and sordid, Henriot felt the pain of it. The motive of the man was so insignificant, his purpose so atrocious. More and more with the name came back his first repugnance, fear, suspicion, and human terror caught him. He shrieked, but as in nightmare no sound escaped his lips. He tried to move. A wild desire to interfere, to protect, to prevent, flung him forward close to the dizzy edge of the gulf below. But his muscles refused obedience to the will. The paralysis of common fear rooted him to the rocks. But the sudden change of focus instantly destroyed the picture, and so vehement was the fall from glory into meanness that it dislocated the machinery of clairvoyant vision. The inner perception clouded and grew dark. Outer and inner mingled in violent, inextricable confusion. The wrench seemed almost physical. It happened all at once. Retreat and continuation for a moment somehow combined. And if he did not definitely see the awful thing, at least he was aware that it had come to pass. He knew it as positively as though his eye were glued against a magnifying lens in the stillness of some laboratory. He witnessed it. The supreme moment of evocation was close. Life, through that awful sandy vortex, whirled and raged. Loose particles showered and pelted, caught by the draft of vehement life that molded the substance of the desert into imperial outline, when suddenly shot the little evil thing across that marred and blasted it. Into the whirlpool flew forward a particle of material that was a human being, and the group soul caught and used it. The actual accomplishment Henriot did not claim to see. He was a witness, but a witness who could give no evidence. Whether the woman was pushed of set intention, or whether some detail of sound and pattern was falsely used to effect the terrible result, he was helpless to determine. He pretends no itemized account. She went. In one second, with appalling swiftness, she disappeared, swallowed out of space and time within that awful maw, one little corpuscle among a million through which the life, now stalking the desert wastes, molded itself a troop-like body. Sand took her. There followed emptiness. A hush of unutterable silence, stillness, peace. Movement and sound instantly retired whence they came. The avenues of memory closed. The splendors all went down into their sandy tombs. The moon had sunk into the Libyan wilderness. 
the eastern sky was red. The dawn drew out that wondrous sweetness of the desert, which is as sister to the sweetness that the moonlight brings. The desert settled back to sleep, huge, unfathomable, charged to the brim with life that watches, waits, and yet conceals itself behind the ruins of apparent desolation. And the wadi, empty at his feet, filled slowly with the gentle little winds that bring the sunrise. Then, across the pale glimmering of sand, Henriot saw a figure moving. It came quickly towards him, yet unsteadily, and with a hurry that was ugly. Vance was on the way to fetch him, and the horror of the man's approach struck him like a hammer in the face. He closed his eyes, sinking back to hide. But before he swooned, there reached him the clatter of the murderer's tread as he began to climb over the splintered rocks, and the faint echo of his voice calling him by name, falsely and in pretense, for help. End of chapter 10 of Sand Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood <laughs>